Chapter, and thank you for being here. I'm really honored to celebrate 10 years of the Aspen Ideas Festival, which is pretty incredible and has really been so thought-provoking and led to world-changing discussions. Think back 10 years. Had the participants been asked to imagine 2014, I wonder how many of them would have predicted the rise of the sharing economy. Uh, the wild proliferation of social media apps, or our culture's obsession with selfies, even our president and vice president. So now think 10 years ahead. Um, it's now 2024, and people are convening to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Aspen Ideas Festival. Um, what would they be discussing? I think no matter, we can't predict, obviously, we don't have a crystal ball, but I think there are three trends that we need to be paying a lot of attention to. The first is the rapid, I would say really astonishing pace of urbanization. Um, there's a global population that is going to reach, it is predicted, nine billion by mid-century. Um, most of those people will be located in cities cities that are on increasingly fragile ecosystems. And that will place, imagine, just the sheer number of people at risk um, in any given time or place. It will be truly unprecedented. The second trend, of course, is climate change, which in the last decade has emerged as such an undeniable contributor to the severity and the extent of disruptions that we are dealing with in our cities, our institutions, our businesses, all of our lives. Um, we know and talk about so many weather climate related disruptions, but a lesser known fact is that actually hot weather kills more Americans than all other natural disasters combined. And the world is heating and we are unprepared for that. Experts predict that summer heat waves will worsen, leading to more and more illness and a greater number of deaths. The third trend is globalization. And certainly we've seen the prof profound impact of this trend. Vulnerability in one place leading to vulnerability elsewhere. An earthquake in Japan shutting down manufacturing in the Midwest United States because of the linkages of the supply chains. Economic shocks and infectious diseases traveling faster and faster without any mind for man-made borders. And these trends will continue to intensify and the interconnections among them to grow stronger. What does this mean then for cities, which is the topic of our conversation today? It means that the shocks and disruptions we experience, and I'm not just talking about ESPN streaming disruptions of the World Cup, which I know has everyone quite frustrated, um, but real shocks and stresses are only going to grow more frequent, more intense, and impact more people. Think of the kinds of shocks, floods, landslides, destructive wildfires, acts of terror, infrastructure collapse, and pandemics. And we are seeing more and more of them around the world. But cities also have to confront chronic stresses, those slowly developing things that also tax the capacity of cities, like crime or poverty or homelessness. Um, we can no longer, and this is an important, really, um, uh, critical statement that I think we'll get back into, Philip. We can't delude ourselves, I believe, into thinking that things will get back to normal one of these days. They absolutely will not. And we are seeing evidence of this over and over again. Nor can we continue to devote such an enormous amount of resources to recovering from disasters that could have been either prevented or responded to much more effectively. So, we have to better manage the unavoidable, and we have to avoid the unmanageable. The good news is that we live in an age where building resilience is not only critical, but where we are really seeing an enormous number of tools and networks and social know-how to become more resilient, certainly um, more than at any time in history. I'll define resilience, and it's a complicated term, which is why we said take a few minutes and start before the questions. Um, we define resilience as the capacity of individuals or communities, organizations, cities, systems, to survive, adapt, and grow in the face of shocks and stresses, and even to transform where conditions require it. And it's not just about keeping bad things out. 
Resilience ensures that a city can operate at its highest function on the best days and also with good function on its worst days. It is also a lever for unpacking and unlocking economic development and business investment, as well as improved social services and more broadly shared prosperity. And this is what I call the resilience dividend. Cities that invest in resilience planning, individuals, businesses, institutions that invest in resilience planning today will reap two very critical benefits. First, and it's been well demonstrated now, they will show faster, stronger recovery from shocks and from crises with fewer lives lost or disrupted, less property and business interruption. And secondly, there are co-benefits to these investments. Investing in resilience yields a city benefits in normal times, job creation, economic opportunity, social cohesion, greater equity. Let me give just two examples, and I think it will clarify and set the stage for our conversation. The first is well known to many in this room. Um, either you experienced or know someone who experienced Superstorm Sandy. Um, disruption in supply chains, the storm did $65 billion worth of damage, the second most expensive um, catastrophe in US history, closed Wall Street for two days and left lower Manhattan in the dark for a, a week. After the storm, Governor Cuomo asked me to co-chair a commission focused on making the state's infrastructure and its systems more resilient. This required us to look at the vulnerabilities that had put our entire system, our entire region, at risk during Sandy and continued to do so. We found, for example, that the electric grid had no capacity for de-islanding or de-networking, so when one piece went down, it took down much more of the grid. We found that although the states had enormous amounts of data, they lacked the analytic tools to mobilize and use those data in the time of crisis. There were vulnerabilities in soft infrastructure as well. The natural buffers that had once protected New York's shorelines, such as tidal wetlands or oyster beds, had been destroyed or they'd been developed for industry and urban development over the last 100 years. So we recommended a variety of changes to try to mitigate these, and in our conversation, we'll, we'll be able to talk more about those. But we are already demonstrating in the New York region that those investments are showing a resilience dividend. We're ex uh, investing in smart grid technology, which will generate millions of dollars of savings to consumers, as well as leading to fewer outages during crises. Boosting the capacity for data analysis will host a variety of other services that the state and cities provide. And so we know we're seeing a resilience dividend. Let's look at a different city and a chronic escalating shock. You may know that Medellin, Colombia was once the most dangerous city in Latin America. For decades, it was trapped in a terrible downward spiral of violence and poverty. There were daily tragedies of murder and corruption, drugs, no services, and unbelievable economic disparity. Over the years, the government had tried a number of efforts to try to loosen the grip of violence and crime in that city, from military interventions to incarcerations. And then in the 1990s, a very forward-thinking government in Medellin stepped back, and they decided to try, to, try, to try a series of investments that would create more resilient communities, communities that would have a better capacity to withstand the drug trade, um, communities that would thrive in, with more job creation, communities that had been fractured and disconnected from the city's core activities. And they focused very imaginatively on mobility and transportation as their first uh, intervention. They um, developed uh, urban cable cars. So if you're in Medellin now, you see series of gondolas like we see here in Aspen um, going up the hills, taking people from disconnect who are, were in disconnected communities um, to their homes and importantly to the sources of uh, work and jobs in the center core of the city. 
there were some communities that were so isolated, and these tended to be the ones most highly correlated with the drug traffic, that they couldn't be reached by the gondola system. So the city built a system of escalators in the sides of the hills that allowed the people, and they had to actually take some of the community leaders to shopping malls to show them what an escalator looked like, um, and got community cooperation to do this, but a wonderful series of escalators. Um, so think of this system now as a resilient system. They serve a critical function in times of disaster, mudslides, earthquakes, which that area is very prone to. Um, they provide an evacuation route, the escalator system, uh, as well as helping emergency crews get to the community more quickly. But it has also integrated the most isolated and poorest and the most violent communities into the city center. Job creation has increased, social services have been linked to where the mobility is in these systems, and crime has been reduced dramatically. Medellin and New York are two of the cities around the world where we at Rockefeller have been working to build urban resilience. And these and other experiences have led us to launch our largest initiative ever, um, which is called 100 Resilient Cities. Um, which is an effort to let, take 100 cities globally um, and help them to build their resilience to shocks and stresses and enable them to create access to public finances and the resources of the private sector, as well as philanthropic dollars to do so. We've named the first 33 cities and the competition reopens um, this year for uh, another third. Cities from Medellin to Byblos, Lebanon, Christchurch, New Zealand, Mandalay, Myanmar, Ramallah, uh, in Palestine, Boulder, Colorado, nearby. Um, and the cities get a variety of services and, and new ideas, but I'll touch on four. Each city gets a chief resilience officer um, who is actually the first person who everyone turns to to link the social, the structural, and the natural infrastructure together as these ideas generate. They develop a resilient strategy and they have resources that we're providing to do that. They have access to a platform of services that leverage beyond the 100 million that we are putting in, including solutions that use big data analytics, new kinds of technologies, resilience land use planning, new kinds of infrastructure design, and new financing and insurance products. Uh, thus far on the platform, we have Swiss Re and Palantir, the World Bank, Sandia National Laboratories, Ushahidi, um, the International Development Finance Fund, and a variety of others. And the cities also join a network of the 100 cities so that there's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, we also hope that we will be developing markets for resilience products as a result of these kinds of collaborations and these kinds of investments, really giving companies an opportunity to imagine uh, how to push the limits of their technology and innovation to benefit all cities. Think, for example, of one, and that is the innovations now in 3D printing. Um, in New York Harbor, we're rebuilding after Sandy with a new system to create pilings that are create, um, replacing the aging and cracking ones um, that held up the city's docks and piers. Um, it's a new form of material com coming through digital printing. Um, and the material is flexible, it's adaptive, it's strong, it actually bends with the wa wave action of storm surges rather than breaking down when there are storm surges, and it's about one-tenth of the cost of the traditional technology. So a lot of new kinds of products and new kinds of innovations. We're seeing 3D printing used at disaster sites now to rebuild housing from the debris of the houses and buildings that are blown and knocked down as a result of whatever um, the disaster is. So again, tremendous resilience building innovation. The one thing I am confident of is that no matter what shock or stress hits um, by 2024, if a city has, res has invested in building its resilience, um, it will yield a resilience dividend, both in making the investments in its day-to-day -day functioning um, and in its longer-term uh, capacity to rebound more effectively. So, Philip, that sort of set the stage, and uh, I look forward to our conversation. Thank you. Thank you.
you know, that, that, that's a great overview. Um, and I'd like to start with a concept that seems closely related. Um, as somebody who writes about architecture, I'm familiar with this is sustainability. And in some ways, this is a response to some of the same stresses, the sense that you know, climate change is happening. We have to you know, deal with emissions. We have to have a smaller footprint in, the you know, a footprint in the environment. What's the Venn diagram between sustainability, which is now kind of fairly well permeated a lot of different um, sectors of thinking, and resiliency, which is um, now kind of a, not necessarily a new thing, but certainly one that you're championing as a new way of thinking about these things. Um, I'll, I'll frame how one builds on the other and then give an example. Sustainability, obviously, is the uh, effort to conserve resources and also to mitigate against future destruction of resources, um, uh, ecosystem resources, the natural environment, and the, and the built environment needs interventions as well. So these are all around the notion of building greater sustainability. That is one important element of building resilience. But building resilience adds other necessary capacities and interventions. Capacities that allow for rebounding more effectively, redundancy in systems, greater uh, connection and feedback loops among information systems, adaptive capacity. So take the example I mentioned quickly, the smart grid. Um, the best, most advanced kind of smart grid technology is both a resilience and a sustainability play. It's a sustainability play because uh, the most advanced smart grid technology allows monitoring of whatever is the best available source of alternative energy in every X period, two hour, four hour, how, however it's monitored. And it tests that against uh, coal or oil or, or, or other kinds of emissions producing. And often now we are seeing that the alternative energy is winning out and the technology allows it to be used. And that provides a lot of savings for consumers and it's a sustainability play in terms of the environment. The resilience part of smart grid technology is that it has a set of smart switches. So if one piece of the system goes down, it can network or de-island it so that it doesn't take the rest of the system down. So that's an amazing capacity, a resilient capacity for an electricity system that goes beyond merely the, and importantly, but merely the sustainability part of it by having both immediate feedback loops, redundancy, and some capacity then to fail safely in that part of the system that's failing. Well, one of the people that you quote in the book, I think, makes a distinction between um, sustainability as a stable system versus resiliency. And stable systems, do they work in some places and not others, or should they all be sort of moving towards resilient systems? So this is a really important point. It was um, Hollings who wrote about, who is a systems theorist, and he was writing about the difference between a system that is stabilizing and a system that is resilient. And his argument, with which I agree completely, is that we can't just have stabilizing systems because stabilizing systems want to return to normal. And the effort to be resilient is to return to something different because normal may be what got you into trouble in the first place. So if we only think about building it back, the same way, or getting back to the stable, we're missing that part that allows for the evolving capacity to actually benefit from transformation that can come from disruption. You know, lots of businesses, and this is sort of casebook and Schumpeter and business theory, look at small disruptions the way we look at vaccinations or inoculations as ways for businesses to test, to reorganize, to challenge new ideas. This is conceptually resilience building, and it's the same sort of phenomenon phenomenon. They don't want to stay stable, those businesses. That would be a really bad thing. We don't want systems to stay stable at a time when the shocks and stresses are increasing and they need to be more resilient. Well, let's move for a second from small disruptions to really, really big ones. Um, much of your book deals with, with, with crisis, with disaster. And you, you remind us something that I didn't know was the case, and it's, it's an amazing moment in history, that FEMA in 2001 
well before 9-11, comes out with their kind of three big scariest case scenarios. One is an earthquake in San Francisco. Two is a terrorist attack in New York. And three is a hurricane in New Orleans. And of course, two of these come to pass. I'd, I'd like to ask about all three of them. Let's start with San Francisco. So at least not since 1989, the big one hasn't happened there. But how are they doing in terms of preparing for that and thinking in terms of resilience? So 1989 was an extraordinary wake-up call for San Francisco. They had obviously had the really big one in the 1900s, but memory fades and the capacity is growing and the city grows. Um, but in 1989, there really was a transformation. San Francisco is about as well prepared for an earthquake as I can imagine anywhere. It's not that they can prevent it, but they actually, I believe, have the capacity to take a disaster that will come from an earthquake and not turn it into a devastating crisis because of the interventions. They have a 20-year program for strengthening all of the soft story infrastructure in buildings. They have a lot of wooden um, footings in a lot of the buildings in San Francisco. Very determined, very systematic program to fix that. They have a completely integrated uh, system of information sharing among the city and all of the services. So um, the utility companies, the cable companies, the wireless providers, the hospitals, in a completely integrated feedback. Sometimes we look at a business or a city and they have their own resilience plan, but they don't integrate or speak to the other plans uh, that the city uh, or that business will have. They have a complete integration. They innovated around, many of you who live in that area know that once a year, San Francisco has thousands and thousands of people from the military who come for Fleet Week. Um, and it used to be a kind of brawl and they would be prepared for it because everybody would drink and party and whatever. For the last four years, they've turned it into resilience building exercises that the Navy does for the citizens and with the citizens of San Francisco. So they do tabletop exercises and planning and they still party at night. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's an amazing way to really think about how to get prepared. Um, I introduced Brian Chesky in the last session and I said that Bayshare, um, which the city helped to create, is a consortium of all of the sharing economy companies in the Bay Area who have or really made their business model on excess capacity so that they will be able to mobilize, as we saw Airbnb do after Sandy, and provide for free a lot of their registered excess capacity in a variety of these domains. So they are one of our first 33 um, cities because we think that they, like Rotterdam, which is another, uh, can be amazing mentors to some of the other cities, but uh, it, it is really quite impressive. But it took three profoundly destructive earthquakes to get them to wake up. To that point. What I'm hoping is that we won't need every city to go through devastation in order to get the message that they need to be prepared. And again, you can't predict everything. We didn't predict Sandy. And when we built after 9-11, just one example, which we found in the Sandy Commission, everybody put their generators in the basement because all the generators had been hit from the top that were around the World Trade Center and all the power went down. Well, guess what? All those generators flooded. So we can no longer build either for the last thing or have a crystal ball for the next. And we don't want 40,000 disaster recovery plans in every city. That's bad, actually, resilience planning. And we saw in one of the hospitals that failed in New Orleans, in Memorial Hospital, um, the brilliant book that Sherry Fink wrote about that, they had 24 disaster recovery plans on the shelf. But n nobody really ever understood them. Nobody ever, anyway. Well, you, you, you mentioned that. You mentioned, I wanted to bring us back to New Orleans and New York, because there are two very different case studies. And, and so it's Mercy Hospital. They mm -hmm. have all these plans. and. Absolutely everything that can go wrong goes wrong. You contrast that with the Coast Guard um, in, as two very different cases of, of being ready and planning for this thing. So what's the, what were the differences in those two responses? So the Coast Guard um, plans for, they have one recovery plan. It doesn't matter what the shock is or what the stress is. 
they train for a certain protocol of what they're going to do, who's in charge, how you respond, what happens if the people in charge aren't available. It's, it's the simplest almost plan in terms of uh, a set of responses and a set of leadership um, delegations that, that I have seen in all the work we've been doing. And so lots of Coast Guard from all over the United States came in to help after Katrina but they had all been trained the same way on the same single plan structure. So it didn't matter whether they had come from New York or from California or from the New Orleans area, they could all respond in exactly the same way. And they were the ones who got, I think about 75% of the people off the roofs within the first 18 hours. Whereas at Memorial Hospital, there were people trapped and dying for um, five days. And, uh, a criminal indictment against the head of that hospital for at least an allegation of euthanasia um, uh, rather than taking those patients out. So um, one horrible failure and one unbelievable success that I think really demonstrates um, uh, what these issues really do, uh, the underlying um, changes that need to come in pla into place uh, in order for these. So there's the planning there's the response period, and then there's the revitalization period. Right. And then after New Orleans, there's a period of what becomes essentially paralysis versus New York, where there seems to be this sort of explosion of ideas and things, you know, technology, new systems, new programs. Why was New Orleans so dysfunctional in that period right after New Orleans? Um, so Katrina. New Orleans, and many of you heard Mitch Landry yesterday, the mayor, current mayor of New Orleans, who I define, Bruce, you interviewed him, I guess, um, I define as optimism on steroids. So it might have been different if he had been the mayor. Um, but New Orleans was a classically non-resilient city. We all know the story of New Orleans. Failing schools, some of the really worst um, schools in the region, very poor governance a very low civic capacity, virtually no social cohesion from one community to another, some really good cohesive communities within a type of community. So it was a failed city. All Katrina did was uncover all of those fractures. When you have a city like that, it really is hard to rebound quickly. What is going on now will make New Orleans so much more resilient when the next thing hits, and something will hit. They are in, in an impossible geography, um, and they know that. So part of it is hard infrastructure. Obviously, there's a great plan to, and almost completed plan, to rebuild the levees. But the more important part of what they're doing is they took over all the public schools in New Orleans. It's the only uh, place in the United States where all the public schools are charter schools and where all parents and kids can opt based on the performance uh, of the school and the teachers. Whatever you feel about the charter school movement, sometimes people feel it cannibalizes from other public schools, and that is, is true in part. But when you have an all charter school system based on performance, it's a very different, and Tulane and the president, Scott Cowan, were tremendously instrumental in, in making that happen. They've become a hub for entrepreneurship. You know, lots of young people who feel, I want to be part of this rebuild. I see opportunities. You know, there was no economic diversity there before. They relied only on tourism and the oil and gas industry. And now you're seeing, and diversity is a feature, a characteristic of resilience. So they're building intentionally, and Mitch uses the word resilience even more than I do. Um, <laughs> intentionally, they are building uh, business structures that have diverse capacity. They're working very intentionally on social cohesion and on really rebuilding those communities um, that have for 50 years been really quite disrupted. And the governance is improving. Again, a great mayor, a better city hall, um, and a lot more optimism. It, it, there was a really fascinating sort of chapter in this when it, it intersects with many things I'm interested in, including kind of urban design. Um, New Orleans loses vast amounts of its population, and it wants to get as many of those people back as it can get back and want to come back. But the problem is that the devastation's been so thorough that they're going here, here, and here, and here, and there's, no, there's no, not enough density, there's not enough concentration of people to actually have a viable city. 
And then there's actually a response to that. And I'd love for you to explain kind of what the entrepreneurial response Absolutely. to that was. Um, this was an effort to restabilize and get things back to normal that couldn't work. Um, you could never, so the idea initially, right after the floods, was let's get all the displaced people back and then everything will be fine and then we'll figure out everything else after that. Um, and that's implausible and of course did not work. Um, and so we, Rockefeller, actually intervened in a very, uh, I think at the time, surprising way because it was a highly charged political environment. And in this audience, you'll appreciate um, Walter Isaacson was the co-chair of the Louisiana Recovery Authority. And the New Orleans planning process was stalled and it was six months and they weren't able to access the federal recovery dollars because they didn't have a plan. So Walter called me and he said, this is really something I know you and Rockefeller could do. I said, I don't think so, Walter. <laughs> but anyway, we did. We intervened, we moved people on the ground, we helped reignite the planning process, we um, engaged all the diaspora communities. So there was bottom-up planning as well as expert-driven planning. It was incredibly collaborative, which is really important for resilience building. But several of the groups recognized very quickly that you couldn't really do what we needed to do with two houses standing on one block and every other one taken down and then four houses one block away and um, it just wasn't going to work. And so four or five organizations that were buying all of these houses or being given them, whether they were private developers or government entities, got into this data-based house swapping system. And so they divided and traded so that you could start rebuilding block by block, no matter who had originally been given it. And that was what led to um, the initial capacity to start bringing people back. But this was six or eight months later, we all saw the horror of people living in FEMA trailers for years. Um, after that. And so, uh, again, we learned a lot from that. New Orleans learned a great deal from that. One of the goals of this book and one of the goals of the 100 Resilient Cities Initiative is that not everybody has to go through it mm -hmm. to prepare to become more resilient. And that, that probably brings us to the point where we should talk a little bit about the, div the dividend part of this. Um, so the peace dividend seems simple, you know, the, the wall comes down and we can, you know, we can move resources from military to, to other things. This dividend is working in a little more complicated way and explain sort of the, the social side of what the dividend means. Definitely. So um, the interventions in resilience are of three different kinds. They're um, hard infrastructure, buildings, land use planning, soft infrastructure, the natural environment, and the social infrastructure. And the capacity in the social infrastructure is often overlooked when you're talking about some of these issues. But we know that more cohesive communities rebound more quickly. Um, Eric Klinghoffer at NYU, for example, did a study of communities that were equally impacted by the Chicago heat wave, and many, many people died um, during that heat wave. And he showed that side by side, equal impact, those communities that rebounded more quickly were those who had higher degrees of social cohesion. They didn't wait for the government to come. Neighbors looked after neighbors. By the time the government got there, people were really well cared for in the high cohesive communities. So as we worked in rebuilding New Orleans and as we're working actually in rebuilding New York and many other cities in which we intervene, a lot of it is focused on community-based, bottom-up, participatory processes. And we're learning a lot from uh, one of the cities that's in our uh, new network, and that is Porto Alegre, Brazil. Porto Alegre um, invented participatory budgeting. So a big chunk of their annual budget gets not voted on, but gets constructed by the citizens in a participatory process. And so the people are saying what they want and what they think is really important. And we're now working with that city to make resilience building part of what the citizens understand. The mayor of Christchurch, New Zealand in rebuilding from the earthquakes, another one of our um, new cities, is actually because they are rubble. So they have to start from scratch. She is 
developing from this idea the notion of participatory democracy, and she is asking the people of Christ Church to draw their voting districts. And they are in their discussions using us in the United States as the negative example, the counter example from what they want to do. They don't want gerrymandered districts that have all like people together so to influence um, the way the election comes out. So they have decided that they want to uh, district their lines to get the most diverse combinations within each district so that they really can have a participatory democracy. So they're redefining what a democracy means. You know, you think about the resilience dividend. I'll give you two more examples that, that we're seeing. Um, Pune in India has for many, many years been investing both in resilient transportation uh, and resilient infrastructure, and also focusing on education and on social cohesion. Uh, Deutsche Bank was looking for a place to um, locate its Indian uh, operations center. And they looked at a lot of cities around India. And they chose Pune because they said they were the most resilient city. So they are realizing a resilience building dividend even before they've had any shock and stress. So you can see these examples. We are rebuilding in New York the Hunts Point market a area because of Sandy. Um, Hunts Point didn't get, uh, and it's in the Bronx, it's our food distribution center. Um, Hunts Point didn't get hit as hard as some of the other areas in New York. But if the tide had been higher two hours earlier when it did get hit, 22 million people would have been without food in the New York region because it serves the entire region. So the resilience building strategy is now reinforce the buffers with wetlands and marshlands, build associated with that a, research, a resilience research center that will create jobs and create new knowledge and new kinds of activities around resilience and then build um, a, a, a more adaptive electricity system that serves Hunts Point. But it's being built to have excess capacity so that if the communities around it get hit, they'll also be able to serve the community around it. It's a real re resilience dividend play. And you can see that kind of idea in action. You mentioned a couple times the, the deaths from heat waves, and, the, and there's a statistic in your book that really took me aback, because it is. It's like four times the number of people who died in 9-11 um, during a fairly similar period. Um, and it makes me wonder how well as a country, how well is the United States doing in terms of understanding its vulnerabilities? Do we, do we have our priorities right in where the big shocks are coming from? So May is the high, hottest May in recorded history in the United States. So we are definitely on the cusp of seeing those kinds of statistics every month, or at least in several months of the year. Um, we are OK. Uh, you heard the president, many of you, um, uh, if you are resilience groupies like our team is, um, at the uh, uh, Irvine graduation speech that he gave. Uh, he talked about a billion dollar investment in resilience building and we're working with the federal government on that initiative. So it will take the 47 communities that have been the hardest hit by all kinds of tragedies in the US over the last three years and put them uh, into line so that they can design features in their communities and this billion dollars will go to, but it's a competition, so not everyone will get it, but uh, it's a way of elevating resilience into the narrative. Um, the president has mandated um, all federal agencies to both have resilience plans and to integrate with one another. Um, the Joint Chiefs of Staff a couple of weeks ago did a resilience building exercise. Um, we spend a lot of time talking to the military um, lack of resilience is a national security risk um, for all countries, but it's a significant one for the United States. So these ideas are not just about climate change, which is why I want you to think about them really deeply. Um, they are about all the shocks and stresses we are experiencing. And resilience builds the capacity to respond to any of them. Uh, and it's a very important concept for that reason, we think. Right. There was a case in Japan after the tsunami and the 
crisis at Fukushima. The government commissions a report. And one of the striking things about the report is that it includes something that's not characteristically Japanese, which is a pretty trenchant self-assessment of the things within Japanese society that kind of led, in terms of character traits and personality types, to the sequence of events in Fukushima. What about in this country? What are our character types, our traits, that in a sense make <laughs> resiliency an uphill, uphill battle? Um, just let me comment on the Japanese because it is, it's extraordinary what they did. It is the first time that their Congress, the Diet, ever commissioned a report on something that went wrong. So we always do that. You know, we have the National Transportation Safety Board. We have a million congressional inquiries anytime somebody hiccups. So we do look a lot at what goes wrong. Um, but uh, it is so uncharacteristic for the Japanese, and it was a very brave thing for them to do. Um, and the report is biting because it really does indict Japanese culture um, to a very significant extent. In the United States, we see a lot of um, our individualist kind of culture coming into play. So um, often one of the resilience problems, and we talk about that in the book, is that a decision made in one part of the country has huge, and it's good for them, has huge impact on other parts of the country. So think about water management decisions in the Southwest and how that's impacting California, um, as I think the metaphor of one of these examples. And so um, how we get more collaboration, you know, we just, I just was so impressed by the sharing economy, and yet we don't have a sharing government democracy in a way. So how we take what the millennials are now seeing as the way they want to live their lives and translate that into how we organize and how government governs and the like, I think is, is a key challenge for us. Um, as uh, given the way we're uh, organized, we can all bemoan the stasis in Washington. We see a lot of energy in the governors and mayors, so we think that's a really good thing in the United States. The West Coast mayors, uh, the um, West Coast and Southwest governors have now organized um, around carbon emissions. They've organized now around water management. This is across the Republicans and Democrats. Um, the governors along the West Coast, California, Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia have created the West Coast Infrastructure Exchange. They've realized that they're all going to put in trillions, or together put in trillions of dollars of new infrastructure. They want to both make it more resilient, but they don't want to make decisions in one part of the West Coast that can hurt dis what others further down or further up are going to experience. So instead, they're collaborating both in how they're going to finance the infrastructure, but also how they're going to plan for and build it. So I'm seeing some promising trends that we're excited about, and some of them um, we at Rockefeller are actually helping to catalyze. Right. One of the really interesting things about the book is that you, at a couple points, you bring the conversation from the sort of policy level, the city's level, national level, right down to the personal level. And I want to ask you about the notion of a personal protocol at the moment of boom. What does that mean? So I started this. Many of you know I'm a psychologist. And so I kept saying to my friends, I don't want to write a self-help book. I really want to write a very scholarly, interesting, case-rich um, book about resilience and what institutions and businesses and cities can do. But I'm a psychologist. And so it, I did inevitably um, think about and wrestle with the individual. And so I would say there are three categories of things, one, one to be aware of and to understand, and the other two you can do something about. The awareness is that there's a huge psychological research on cognitive distortions and memory biases. And so we often are influenced by that salient event uh, Nancy Reagan gets a breast, or um, I'm sorry, Betty Ford gets a breast cancer diagnosis and 100,000 women the next day had mammograms, so literally. 
So the question is, should we respond to our memory biases and always be um, influenced by that which is most salient, or should we think more in an integrative way and understand? And we can be aware as individuals. You know, if you go into a hotel room, they now tell you where the exit is. That's really important because you need to be aware of what you can do to help yourself um, if something goes wrong. Increasingly, you need to be aware of what you can do to help yourself in your home if something goes wrong, in your office. Too often, we rely on others to be the ones who are going to get us organized or prepared for that. So our own awareness and a, in good times is, I think, a critical feature of this. There's preparedness, but we don't know what the next thing is. Clearly, um, I'm not recommending building you know, nuclear shelters or, or stockpiling canned goods or water, but knowing that you have enough if something goes wrong or that you know how to get it or where to get it from is, is really important. And don't only count on that which is most familiar. You know, businesses are disrupted, other people are disrupted. So you do need to figure out um, what you can count on yourself for. And then you need to think about what you can do for others because social cohesion is really, and social issues are a really important piece of that. So there are many architects, architecture firms, planners, one of them in the room, Michael, um, really thinking about how design and architecture um, can be built. And many of these folks are donating a percentage of their time to plans and systems. We have the um, Design for Humanity at American Institute of Architects on our platform for 100 resilient cities. Um, and they are going to work with cities all over the world, giving pro bono. So what can I do for others? Is my intervention in my community, am I engaged enough? Do I know people well enough to expect that I should help them and that they can help me? Going back to some of the communitarian things that really made America great, or any country great, but let's talk about us in America, you know, that de Tocqueville admired and it, Putnam in writing a Bowling Alone hit a chord in our, he back, went back to the national character issue. We're not going to be resilient if we continue to bowl alone. So we've got to reverse that course in our own communities, building one by one, individual by individual. So those are the three categories of things that I think we each can do, that we each ought to feel committed to do, that we'll have more resilient people, communities, societies, and hopefully the world. I think we have time for questions. I don't want to monopolize the whole time. So let's go to you guys. Um, how about right here? You can go to the okay. mic, or there's one on your side right here. If you're on this side, use the mic here. So yeah, and line up, and right. we'll pass this one around. Okay. Uh, Wonderful work. I, I mean, it's, it's really, really inspiring. I come from a, from a country and from a city that is used to systemic shocks. So I come from Jordan, and I live in the city of Amman. And we've seen, I mean, trans I mean we, we've mastered the art of dealing with shocks. I think, just as an example, just with the refugee crisis, now from Syria, our population has significantly grown. Whether it's the water issue, there's just a million little things that, that are constantly happening. And I'm doing a lot of work in this space, and I'll share some of it with you later, but just the one area that I just wanted to ask about is, we talk about infrastructure type projects, but it really, the, the challenge that I've seen is human infrastructure. And, and, you know, uh, uh, from a resilience perspective, <laughs> the capability of government at the middle level, at city governments at the middle level, to be able to adapt to these shocks or to be able to facilitate the concept of building for resilience, mm -hmm. right? And the second challenge I see that I have seen and I'd love your thoughts on is the disconnect between at the national level and at the city level because I think I come from a country, but I think it's very common for other countries that face these challenges where the national government is, has to deal with reactionary issues. I mean, there's, 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 these things are unplanned. But the net, I mean, the person who pays the net cost are at the city level. And I'm just wondering about that disconnect. Um, 
let me give an example of Byblos, Lebanon. So Byblos is one of our first 33 cities. And uh, it's been amazing in, on two levels to watch. All of the work that we do starts with what we call an agenda setting workshop. And they have to bring together, and nobody wins this competition if they haven't applied in a collaborative consortial way. But the workshop includes the private sector and government, civil society. Um, we make sure that uh, the poorest and most vulnerable are represented in those workshops. The mayor of Byblos invited to his resilience setting workshop the mayor of Amman, the mayor of Cairo, and the mayor of Tripoli, um, both Syria and Lebanon, both Tripolis. And um, he invited all of the generals in the national government, the harbor master, the most popular nun in town. It was really amazing on just the set of issues that you're talking about. So we see in this the capacity to link both forms of government and different sectors. The mayors are proselytizing and teaching and learning from one another in really extraordinary ways. They flew after that workshop to Ramallah, which is another one of our cities, and worked with them on planning their workshop. So stay tuned. I can't promise where all of this is going, but step one has been pretty brilliant, and it's from them. I mean, we're watching. We're so glad we only picked 33, because we're watching and we're learning so much from what they are doing on the ground. You know, innovation comes in times of stress, and it comes from the bottom up. It doesn't only come from big, expensive R&D labs. And we are seeing extraordinary innovation. Let's get some more questions in. Um, right here. Judith, that's really fascinating talk. Thank you so much. And the book sounds fantastic. I don't know if this sounds. Um, the other time, other times that the word dividend has been used is in terms of the demographic dividend. And we know that was part of the reason behind the success of the Asian Tigers, that there was a huge population boom and there were investment, very critical investment, in workforce training and education. So it seems to me that with this resilience dividend, there's a very, very strong need for investment in the three areas you outlined. What's the policy advocacy agenda in the places where you don't have a Landro or, you know, where, how can you inspire policy that would embrace and make the investments that are needed for this dividend to happen? And then sort of as a corollary to that, what's the mean? You refer yeah. to bowling alone, but how does this become the word resilience it's hard for people to get their heads around. It is. It's, it is a difficult concept. Um, on the demographic dividend, I would say that we are terrified that there will be the opposite of a demographic dividend in Africa, both in Northern Africa and in Sub-Saharan Africa. They will grow from 200 million young people to 400 million young people within the next maybe 30 or 50, 50 years. And there is simply not enough capacity to absorb all of those young people. So we've got to build in those countries and in those communities greater resilience if we invest now. So there's a tremendous amount of attention and focus on resilience building activities around education, around job creation, around food security, around water protection. Um, and we have been infusing into all of that work resilience building characteristics. And we've been proselytizing all over the place to policymakers. So we work with, uh, I'm just picking Africa because we're so hard at work on it and because we're so worried about the demography. Um, working tremendously with the African Union, tremendously with all of the regional economic unions, many of the country leaders um, where we work. So uh, a lot of policy shift um, towards education. Uh, South Africa just passed new legislation on um, 
an amazing tax regime for companies that train young people, but really train them, skill them up, and create apprenticeships, not just internships, that's very innovative and that a lot of the other leaders in Africa are looking at. We see some interesting ideas emerging in Nigeria as well. So I said in response to your question about um, stability that we're influenced by systems theory. Resilience is a systems concept. And so policy is such a critical part of the framework of the system um, that interventions at that level are absolutely critical as well. How are we doing? We're right at hmm, one more, but really fast. Uh, back here. Stand up, though. Perfect. So again, Judith, I think tremendous work that Rockefeller is doing in terms of um, working with cities to sort of build up resilience plans. But I think, you know, building a plan is, is a part of the solution. I think the difficulty comes when you try to implement resilience plans. So I was at a meeting um, uh, last year with the city of Toronto, which, a, and this is specifically about climate resilience, where they've done tremendous work in sort of predicting the impact of climate change on their city, and they know exactly what to do. But they, f they just lack the political will to make the decisions, including investments in hardening infrastructure, sort of rezoning, redistricting, things that will hurt people in the short term. So I guess my question to you is, how do we inspire policymakers, especially in this sort of political reality of extreme polarization um, that we all live in? So not every city will have the political will to take this on. Um, we look for evidence of that political will in selecting in the 100 cities those that will be in the network. So we've sort of ticked off a little bit of that issue um, in the selection process. But we really do think, and that's why I want to emphasize the resilience dividend, that what we can demonstrate with data now to a politician is that even in the short term, there will be a benefit in these investments. Often the investments have been characterized as so far out, and we know that politicians have short-term <laughs> horizons. And so compared to other things that they could invest in that have more political sizzle, uh, th this goes lower on the priority. But if we can show the job creation, the economic development, uh, all of those issues that are part of this dividend, it has started to tip. Uh, the thinking of, of some of the most recalcitrant. In every one of the, we've done 20 of the 33 cities, the initial agenda uh, setting workshop, the mayors have been extraordinary. And as I said, they are proselytizing to other mayors as well. So when you will start to have shining examples of the benefits of these investments, and the Pune example, there are richer cities in India that could have gotten that operations center. They all vied for it. Mumbai and Delhi took notice that Pune got it. They started to think in a different way about what capacity they needed to build to continue. So they watch, they learn. Um, it doesn't happen all at once. Great. Thank you. Dr. Drew the Broden, the Rockefeller Foundation.